Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Denis Jidic and I'm the Executive Director of the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we, about transitional justice and reporting about in transitional justice and how we use oral history or really powerful first person survivor victim testimonies uh, to promote fact-based journalism and fact-based narratives around wartime atrocities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so let me just give you to start with really short uh, intro into the conditions we work in and the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so probably most of you know that we had uh, a very large war in the early 90s, so from 1992 to 1995. Uh, during this, this conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina alone, about 100,000 people were killed, 2 million people were displaced, 40,000 women uh, were um, sexually uh, violated and uh, as a result of all of these wartime atrocities the country is still in 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 a pretty much perpetual uh, crisis mode uh, the reason for this is that we have simply never strategically implemented any kind of transitional justice mechanisms uh, so basically from the prosecutions of war crimes which have been completely politicized to uh, the other pillars of transitional justice which are the right to truth institutional reform and uh, reparations for victims, none of these things have been systematically addressed in the country. And we pretty much today have the same political elites that we had in the early 90s. Uh, now, uh, the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, which I'm a part of in Bosnia and Herzegovina, is, is a broad network working all across the Balkans, but in Bosnia and Herzegovina we are specifically focused on transitional justice reporting, which means that we have a systematic approach in which we monitor absolutely all war crime trials, we monitor uh, hate incidents, we report on all of the uh, laws and strategies which should be adopted uh, in the country in order to address the wartime legacies, for instance, the, that we are in, in this year we are marking the 30th anniversary since the start of the war and the country still does not have for instance a law on torture victims which means they don't have any kind of systematic place to, to address uh, uh, any kind of uh, rights in terms of getting them from the state. Uh, as a result of our systematic reporting and really providing a platform for victims to, to, to give their voices uh, uh, space in the public area, uh, we've also been awarded the European um, Press Prize for 2020 and uh, this was as a result of, of really long-term reporting about all of the rights of, of, of victims in, in the country which are not addressed. Now, as I've mentioned, we've been reporting in a very similar way, which is very analytical, court monitoring and trials and systematic approaches to, to really analytical features about laws and strategies from 2004. And what we've noticed is that there was a difficulty to really combat the denialist and, and uh, revisionist narratives that the uh, uh, politicians in the country were promoting, which are the ones spreading divisions. So about two or three years ago, we've really tried to radically change the way that we approach our reporting and decided to try uh, uh, to build these uh, multimedia websites which are specifically designed to cover certain topics which are very divisive in our country and to use oral history or first-person interviews with victims and, and uh, survivors of the mass atrocities which are being denied in the country by the politicians, as I've mentioned, uh, to really combat those. Uh, so the first project that we did was with the Srebrenica Memorial Center, which is uh the, the biggest memorial center in the country. So you've all probably heard about Srebrenica. It's a place where in the 1992-95 genocide, specifically in July 1995, uh, genocide took place. About 7,000 men and boys were killed and about 40,000 um, elderly people, women and children were expelled. Uh, now these crimes have been proven in about 40 to 50 different war crime proceedings. However, despite that, we are still 
still seeing a rise of uh, revisionist narratives, denial of these crimes all across the region, Republika Srpska and Serbia, and, and these uh, narratives are also gaining international connections through far-right groups. So what we wanted to do is really to push the narratives away from the specific name of the crime, whether it's genocide or not, to push the narratives away from the numbers of 7,000, is that enough for genocide and not, and really to focus on the individual stories, and we call the specific projects the lives behind the fields of death, to really tell the stories of an entire community which is now missing and, and lives that can never be returned. Uh, now we're going to show you one of the videos, they're very short, um, uh, from a mother who's lost her child, and then later on I'll explain a little bit more about the specific project. Ja se zovem Hajdarević Mina, 57. sam godišta iz Srebrenice. Ja doniram Memorialnom centru majicu i trinerku Gorni. Na slikama se nalazi moj sin Edin. Prva je slika slika na 93., a druga je 94. Pismo je pisato preko Crvenog krsta. Sestra mi je bila izbjegla u Sloveniji i Moj Edin je pisao tetki svoju u Sloveniju kako on ide u školu, kako je on sebi našao curu, da mu ponese farmerice. To su odjemna predmeta koje je on nosao za vrijeme rata u Srebrenci. I dijete ložilo vatru, igralo se, ko omladina imao je svoji drug uva, pa je kod moje mami ode gore, nalože vatru, kuhaju neku kafu i to je izgorelo na rukavima. Moj jedin je imao 12 godina kad je rat počeo. 95. osmi razred je završio. Pošao je u prvi razred srednji. Tad je se osnovala škola u Srebrenci. Bio dobar učenik, volio je karate, volio je društvo. Meni što je sure za lusjećanje, on ko momčić prema mojoj majke nagradi, imala je jedna pozida. Curca neka sjedi sa njim, ja naišla meni, kaže li meni mama, ja našao sebi cur. Ja sam gledala moj njega, rekao, dobro sine, neka se, hajte vi sjete, ja odam. I vjerujte, ja sad živim na gradu, ja svaki put provođim pored te pozite. Ja sjedim na tu pozitu, ja odplaći, gladan je poginu. I vjerujte, ja danas imam sve. Sve, ja kad sjedim da jedim onaj, meni zaloga je svaki put stani u grdu. Svaki put mi on nambat, naupani, što je on željan od to svega. Što je poginuo glada, što su ga ubili gladnog. Za njega sam ga put vidjela kad smo se rastali kod bezinske pumpi. Vijećali kud, šta, da ga vodim sa sobom, uzećem ga u potočarima, da ga pošaljem preko šume i to mi nije rješenje. I riješili smo da ide preko šume i otišao je preko šume. Rastavili smo se, nismo se zagrli, nismo se, nisam znala da se više nikad nećemo biti. I da 25 godina tragam za kostima. Moja najveća želja da pronađim i da ukopam to svoje dijete i kad bi onog momenta umrla. Za mene je memorialni centar nešto svetu. Za mene ovo mezar je svetu. Niko nek ne zaboravi šta je se desilo ovu. Uh, so you can see they're very, very powerful first-person testimonies about really the, the most heinous wartime atrocities. Uh, the concept that we did was also to, to create a live space within the Memorial Center, which you can all look at uh, if, you, if you look online for the lives behind the fields of death. There's even a virtual tour. So the place is in Srebrenica, and we asked all of the 100 persons that we've interviewed uh, based on this oral history methodology, and their interviews lasted for hours and hours, to also give and an actual artifact that belonged to the victim uh, so that in Srebrenica when visitors want to come they can pass through this area look at the actual um, uh, look at the artifacts that belong to the victims and then also look at the videos uh, of persons who are talking about this trauma uh, and what we have found is that these shorter three-minute videos two and a half are really really much more uh, uh, spread on social media, uh, people are looking at them, people are sharing them, they get much more interested about the topic 
in a non-divisive manner, which is something very different to what we're seeing uh, when compared to our traditional, let's say, uh, more analytical reporting or feature reporting about issues related to wartime atrocities. And we've really tried to use this and to, um, and to try and build other similar projects. So in the spring of this year, we also did a similar project called 44. Uh, so as I mentioned, in April, uh, we marked in Bosnia the 30 years since the beginning of the, the Sarajevo siege and the war. So the siege lasted for 44 months and about 10,000 people were killed. Uh, so what we wanted to do is to uh, really make a uh, short first person testimony for every month of the siege and we didn't we specifically didn't want to make everyone about the most uh, horrific things that happened during the war so we do have some very powerful ones that are related to wartime atrocities during the siege but we also have some that are related to uh, let's say sports during the siege or uh, gathering wood or water or how schools function during the siege and it's quite a unique platform, which, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what we have seen is that during the spring months, it was immensely shared on social media. It's quite a unique platform that tells the story of the siege uh, in a very, very different way. Uh, so strategically for us, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned, is to be a platform that really systematically addresses all of the pillars of transitional justice. So if you're interested in what a country should do in terms of overcoming the legacies of a very, very difficult past in terms of ensuring human rights and ensuring things like that never happen again, uh, to be a platform where all of those, all that information exists and really provide a platform for the victims who are not getting the rights that they should, um, uh, th that they have a voice in the public area. Uh, so what we want to do is, is use kind of what, what we get from these kind of stories, the public support and the sharing to ensure that in the future we kind of had, despite this political capture that we are seeing all across the Balkans and unfortunately in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well, that there is a place where um, there is a public push at least, uh, a, a smaller one if, if nothing else, for uh, uh, ensuring that somebody is facing with the past, that there is a transitional justice approach and there is a strategy behind it. And uh, in, in this year, what we're hoping to do at the end of this year is also to build a huge, we've been working on this for almost two years now, a very, very large database of all court-determined facts that's going to incorporate a lot of these first-person uh, testimonies that are connected to individual atrocities. What we're hoping to do is also to make a subsection of that entire platform an educational tool in which we are going to uh, have experts build into this database uh, ways in which these materials can be used uh, for educational purposes. What we are hoping to do is that at least some parts of our country where there isn't such an amount of political capture, although those are small, will take this up and in the future it will be something that's used for younger generation, for journalists, in order to ensure that educationally speaking, we are at least uh, uh, teaching them in, in, uh, about what actually happened during the war and how to ensure human rights uh, for those victims and especially in terms of the public reporting uh, about uh, the legacies of the past. Uh, and I'm going to end with the fact that what we're also hoping to do next year is to uh, build an entire manual which will use all of our almost 20 years, so 19 years next year, experience in systematic reporting about transitional justice to provide uh, trainings for places like the Ukraine, which are going to be dealing, unfortunately, in the future with all of these issues of transitional justice and a lot of the same uh, denialist uh, narratives. And, and hopefully, uh, this can be something uh, that's, uh, that's very, very helpful all across the world. And thank you. I'm going to stop there. So if you have, guys have any kind of questions. No, no. That's yours. It's just mine. Nobody takes my mic away. 
Hi. Um, I can see the advantages of working together with museums and social institutions. Are there any disadvantages to having these collaborations as journalists and as a media organization? Uh, sure, uh, a number of them. So, uh, for instance, in just in terms of the actual uh, speed with which we do things and the planning, which for us can be pretty swift in terms of actually working with uh, uh, Balkan specifically uh, museum organizations, you need to have much more meetings and much more time and much more planning. Uh, also in terms of uh, uh, the actual narratives, the actual use, uh, unfortunately you should always be wary about the fact that uh, potential these places are also um, uh, state funded and state owned so unfortunately in some instances there is uh, uh, let's say a disbalance between what is what are their wishes and how inclusive they want to make it and uh, what a specific media organization wants uh, for us spe specifically in this project we didn't have any of those issues but then also we we've had a longer collaboration in terms of reporting about Srebrenica, so I think that there was already an understanding of what Birn is and what Birn is doing and how we do things, and a discussion before we actually went into the, into the project that some of these things are uh, sh have to be done in terms of our editorial standards, but I would definitely uh, caution anyone wanting to do projects like this that they need a specific amount of time and they need to be very specific in agreeing uh, all of the things of what should be used and where uh, and how that uh, communication actually goes out. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask if there is an organization that uh, is supporting you financially. Fi uh, sorry, fin financially. Uh, yeah, uh, so Birn is basically uh, funded uh, entirely by uh, donors, so primarily it's uh, EU or US, uh, EU countries or US or the uh, European Union as such. Uh, so basically what uh, Birn in the entire region has uh, a strategy, so our core is rule of law reporting and that kind of incorporates all of these elements that I've discussed and then each country has specific focuses, so in Bosnia Herzegovina, it's more transitional justice, security, far-right groups, and then corruption. Uh, but for instance, in North Macedonia, it's much more related to corruption uh, than it is to transitional justice, since they didn't have this entire legacy of the war. But there's an umbrella strategy, and through that strategy, we apply for particular projects that we want to do that are within that kind of umbrella strategy. So uh, that's basically it. Uh, in terms of the actual funding, uh, the good thing is that the situation is quite problematic in the entire region, so there is no lack of uh, international presence and opportunity for, uh, for fundraising, but on the other hand, that's obviously quite negative for the entire region. Uh, how do you find uh, the inspiration about uh, the projects you are uh, making? Well, luckily for us, we have a really, really dedicated team and, and from the about, we have 12 journalists and editors, most of those have been really in the organizations for a number of years. Uh, so I've been working personally from, from 2008 and, and we have a number of colleagues that are extremely, extremely dedicated to these stories and they're really uh, living them and owning them. So it's, it's, it's quite something to see. I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more proud of the entire team. And in that sense, there is no lack of ideas. Uh, there's much more lack of actually uh, finding ways in which you can write projects in a way that you actually get donors enough to do uh, what you intend to do, which is sometimes a challenge and there are various limitations on what you can do within projects and how to spend money and so forth. Uh, and we never want to be an organization that kind of runs after financing wherever it goes. So when you have a lot more finances for 
the mi migration crisis that we report about that, and then the next year we report about corruption because that's in the focus of the EU. As I mentioned, we have the strategy and we have a list of things kind of that we want to achieve within specific projects, and then we also, through strategic planning, we also try uh, and think ways into the future of how we can improve things, and that's where we really came up with these individual stories and, and, um, and really uh, creating live areas of remembers, remembrance and journalism. Uh, and that's really yesterday you've heard my colleague from the Beer Network uh, talking about the reporting house, which will be open next year in Sarajevo, which is a museum that will incorporate uh, the journalistic narratives about the breakup of Yugoslavia, the propaganda, the, uh, the, the, and the consequences of the entire war in terms of the divisions in the region, um, and journalistic reporting and actual situation on the ground. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is really through some of these places that we have already finished, like Srebrenica, like the ones, uh, we also have a smaller one in, in Tuzla, um, to build really a beer journalistic museum that's, that will be there, um, like that, that will stand really as a standalone uh, museum uh, to really be a place of, of like meeting and, and, and really um, uh, teaching young journalists especially about how to report systematically about all of the issues of transitional justice. Hi, so with the emphasis that you place on testimonials, um, do you find that people are willing to share their stories? Do you have to look for them? Have they shared their stories before and didn't get them anywhere, so they're doing it again, hoping that, how do you gain their trust? Basically. Yeah. Uh, so luckily for us, as I mentioned, Bjorn kind of has already, let's say, a renome, like an experience, and, and we are quite known in, uh, let's call it, the, the community of, uh, uh, of, uh, of victims and survivors. So you have a large uh, groups of uh, associations of former victims, of missing persons' families, and uh, we have a very good collaboration with them because we have systematically been reporting about all of their issues for almost 20 years years but that's not the end of it you have to invest a lot of time and a lot of effort in order to talk to people uh, they have traumas which you need to uh, take into account which uh, all, all our journalists go through trainings in which they uh, see which in which they learn techniques not to enhance that trauma when they talk to uh, individual victims when to stop an interview how to address them um, and these are all very very important things for us that we take special care uh, and then also for all of these videos we take a lot of time to explain what they will be used for how they will look in the end what their actual purpose is because Unfortunately, a lot of media who report on specific issues in a sensationalist way use short bites about from these uh, testimonials or talk to the same victims that we do, uh, but use them in, let's say, for political purposes, for specific purposes that they want in specific stories. So what we try to do is, is really make them feel part of this process. And I think the idea of also of providing live spaces for them means a great deal. They, they have... A, um, for a lot of them, they can't really even believe that, you know, uh, artifacts that belong to them personally or for their loved ones can be in such a place. So I think that that's also very, uh, very powerful and I think it, uh, it connects and resonates with them a lot. Hi, I would like to ask you, is true that uh, the Western media, it's, uh, they use double standards? about the journalism in the area of uh, Balkans. For example, you focusing all the Western media against uh, and accuse Serbia or uh, Republika Srpska or some parties of uh, this region. Uh, tell me, how can you be trustable when you use only the one way you don't use uh, the sources of the other sides? Thank you. I think that unfortunately there's a lot of bias 
in reporting, not just from Western media, but specific, even more from local media across the Balkans. Uh, I think on the one hand side, there is, uh, specifically on, on Western media, there is an, and we are a small area, so I can understand that, there is an over-focus on individual incidents. So basically, Srebrenica is much more known than any other atrocity that has happened. So when we have July 11th coming every year, we know in Biren that we are going to get calls from journalists arriving for those days. And what they want is a quick story. They want us to help find me a victim, find me an expert, find me somebody who's going to deny it so I can have both sides. And that, I think, provides a very simplistic way of how the international audiences cover it. We in Biren try to do the things in a very different way, which complicates our lives. When we do features about missing persons, we go out of our way to incorporate people of different ethnicities, even to tell the same stories. Because we know the first attack is going to be, yeah, but why is this individual, uh, why did you choose a Serb victim or a Bosniak victim or this for? Uh, what, what, when we did the first project that we did related to Srebrenica, the question was, why Srebrenica? And then the, when we did the second one related to Sarajevo, the question was, well, why? But we incorporated also people from various ethnicities within the video, so that kind of uh, fights against these kind of narratives or pushing them, uh, pushes them away. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I think the situation in the media landscape is so politicized that it's difficult for projects like this to really gain wide recognition, and that's something that we have to work to address, and the international community does as well. And I think also in terms of international representation, I think unfortunately a lot more needs to um, happen in order for us not to have the exact same dates that we mark in international media related to Bosnia or Serbia or uh, Kosovo. And uh, I think that that, on the one hand side, um, forces the international public to look at the entire region as this perpetual loop where nothing is happening but the same kind of thing and, on this, and that nothing can be done to improve the situation there where in effect a lot can be done. And then on the second hand side is that it's just simplistic. It's there, there's no uh, added value to it. Uh, so I hope that that will change. Uh, so that's it. I'm sorry about your question, but we can talk uh, later. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me.